Hebrews is one of the most uh, lengthy and intricate doctrinal books of the New Testament. It's kind of like the book of Romans. It covers the, the, the spectrum of uh, a New Testament theology. And it does it in a, uh, a form that we would call comparison. And it shows how Jesus is the answer to everything because he's better than everything else. He's the, he's the only game in town. He's the only one that can do all these things that we so desperately need. And so that is the theme of the book. Today I want to uh, take the latter portion of the chapter and I want to talk about a kingdom and a king. Let me ask you this question. Doesn't a kingdom take on the characteristics of the king? Wouldn't you say that was true? You work for a company and you know you have a, an owner and, uh, and CEO of the company uh, and he's a strong person. That company takes on his characteristics. Uh, those people that are like him that can stand him will stick around and those that don't, they'll leave. Or those that become a part of that a workforce will say, well, you know, the boss said it's either my way or the highway and I need a job. So I'm going to do it his way as long as he's paying me to be on the job. Well, so it is with a kingdom. A kingdom is even stronger. Uh, it, it, a kingdom is more able to reflect the nature of a king because of the autonomous nature of a king. I mean, by virtue of definition, the word king means he's in charge. Completely. Totally. I want to talk about various kingdoms, but I want us to talk about the kingdom of God and how that kingdom is a kingdom you want to be a part of because it's got the characteristics of the great king. And the latter part of the first chapter of the book of Hebrews talks about the uh, character of that kingdom. Let's start again in the verse 1, probably the last time we're going to read that for a while, and we'll read through verse 14. God who at sundry times and in diverse manners spoke in the time past unto the fathers by the prophets, as in these last days, spoken unto us by his son. When do those last days begin? At the cross. We're already in the last days. Don't say the last days are ahead of us. We are in the last days. Read, the, or read, read Acts chapter 2. He has in these last days spoken unto us by His Son. And His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, is the theme of the book of Hebrews. I know it's called Hebrews because it was written to those uh, people who were primarily of Hebrew stock, but they were believers, whether they were Hebrews or whether they were Gentiles. And there were people who were being tempted to go back unto the Hebrew tradition and they were to become Judaizers again. So twice over the book of Hebrews is, is, is tagged in that way. But this book is about Jesus. Amen? Matter of fact, you cut the Bible anywhere. And it's going to bleed Jesus. Amen? Whom he has appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. Speaking of Jesus, it says, Who, being the brightness of God's glory, and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins. Don't you like that little three-word phrase? Purged our sins. Wow. What a job. After he did that, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, being made, that is, being come into the world and assumed a certain position, so much better than the angels as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. For to which of the angels said he, that is God, said at any time, you are my son. He didn't say that to the angels. Sometimes loosely they're called sons of God, but they're never called the son of God. You are my son. This day have I begotten you. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. These are quotes from the Old Testament. And again, when he brings in the first begotten into the world, first begotten means he has the chief rank. He has the primary seat. Like the firstborn son in a family inherited the larger portion, and he was in charge of the family business, whatever it happened to be, when the father passed it on to his kids. The first begotten, the firstborn, he said to his firstborn uh, when he brings him into the world, he says, and let all the angels of God worship him. We talked about that last week. He's so much better than the angels. 
And of the angels, he says, he who makes his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. But unto the Son, he says, your throne, O God. Notice that. God the Father is saying unto God the Son, calling him God. Don't be afraid to call Jesus God. Now, go ahead and get ready for the fact that you can't explain how God the Father is God, God the Son is God, and God the Holy Spirit is God. I can't explain that. But God is both plural and singular. He is one God, but He eternally exists in three persons. That's good. When I get to heaven, I'm going to understand it. When I get to heaven, I can explain it in fine detail. I won't have to, because you'll understand it too. Amen? That day we will know even as we are known. I like that. I'm looking forward to that. I'm going to figure out my wife on the day I get to heaven. Won't that be wonderful? But she won't be in my life anymore. She'll be my sister and my best friend. Because you can't build a relationship like that and have it go away in heaven. No, it just gets better. But there, no, there's no marriage or given in marriage in heaven. But I will finally understand my wife. God made her different, you know. Ladies, look at your husband and say, you are different. Husbands, look at your wife and say, you are different. <laughs> Boy, I'm chasing rabbits. <laughs> but unto the Son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. Underline that if you want to. A scepter of righteousness, you can underline that if you want to, is the scepter of your kingdom. He's describing the characteristics of the king and his kingdom. And look at the next uh, phrase there in verse 9. You have loved righteousness. Underline that. And, and don't, don't miss this. He not only loved righteousness, but he hates. He has hated, he does hate, and he will always hate Iniquity. Now, iniquity is that word for sin that encompasses the whole lawless aspect of sin. All sin is lawless. All sin is doing what I want to do instead of what God wants to do. It's like when the, the devil got puffed up in his own pride when he conceived sin within himself and he said, I will exalt myself. I will be equal with God. And God says, no, you won't. Now, he's still running around causing trouble, but he's done. And one day, all that's left is the mop-up, and God's going to take care of that. But you see, he hates iniquity. You see, get this through your thick, independence-loving American mind. And I'm saying this back to me the same time I'm saying to you. Get this through your thick, independence-loving American mind. You were not made to do as you pleased. I got one amen. Maybe two. You were not made to do as you pleased. Amen. You were not made to do as you pleased. Amen. All right. We got to get that. I'll tell you what, if you don't get that, you know what you'll do? You go right on thinking that you ought to have your way. You ought to do as you please. And you know where that gets you. You ever read about Br'er Rabbit and the Tar Baby? The more you mess with that Tar Baby, the deeper you get. You know what? He has loved righteousness and hated iniquity. How many of you, how many of you can see? I'm, I'm going to major on that quite a bit this morning. Therefore God, even your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness. Underline gladness. Those are the three characteristics of His kingdom. We'll talk about those above your, your fellows. And you, Lord, there's God the Father calling His Son Lord again. In the beginning you laid the foundations of the earth and the heavens are the works of your hands. They shall perish, but you remain. They shall wax cold as does a garment. I'm retiring clothes every week because they get these big holes in them and the holes get so big they're uncomfortable to wear. You have to throw them away. Get all stained and nasty. You have to throw them away. Garments wax old. And as a vesture, you shall fold them up, speaking to the whole creation. And they shall be changed. But you, Lord, are the same. 
and your years shall not fail. That's because his life is eternal. Now, here, this will absolutely stretch your brain to the point of snapping. God always was. I told you this before, I think I need to repeat it because we're living in an age where people believe that matter is eternal. Even Einstein came to the conclusion that matter is not eternal. Physical matter, space and time have a point of beginning. They have a point of beginning. There's a point in which there was no carbon, silicon, iron, hydrogen, oxygen. These things were only found in the mind of God until He spoke them into existence out of nothing. Now, if you just ever let that get a hold of you, you will begin to understand how great is our God. His age is eternal. It's timeless. He always was. He exists. By the way, what is the name that God gave to Moses when Moses said, hey, when I go back to those folks, I need to tell them what your name is. I don't even know your name, God. And he said... I am that I am. And you know, theologians and grammarians have been trying for years and years and years to try to catch a hold of the full uh, import of that Hebrew word, uh, Yahweh, which means I am totally self-existent. I don't need anything. I exist. I always have existed. I always will exist. All of this is wrapped up in the name I am. That's why it flipped out those poor Pharisees when Jesus told them before Abraham was, I am. Jesus is the eternal self-existing God with the Father and with the Holy Spirit. But to which of the angels said he at any time, sit on my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Are they, again speaking of the angels, are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be Heirs of salvation. There's a great warning in the next chapter. We're going to get to that next week. Pray with me, please. Father, I do pray that we will see the kingdom. And more than that, that we will see the king. That we will love the king. And therefore, we will love your kingdom. And Father, I pray that for every soul in this room today, that by the revelation of your grace that we will honestly say from our heart, Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven right now. Please grant it for Jesus' sake. Amen. I want to talk about the kingdoms of this world first. Because we don't live in the sweet by and by. We still live in the nasty now and now. And it's nasty. And it's not getting any better. How many of you know it's not getting any better? How many of you are optimists and you think it's going to get better in the short run? Okay, well, you're wrong. <laughs> and, I, and I, you know, I think it's, I think being an optimist is a, I mean, if you're going to fail on one side, you might as well be looking for something good. Because, you know, if you go around looking for bad, you're, you're going to find it. If you go looking for something good, you might find a little bit of it. That's okay. But the world itself is in the downhill mode. I mean, it's on a greased incline. And it's picking up speed. Anybody that's lived 50, 60 years, you know it's getting worse more rapidly than it ever has in history before. And it, and it seems to be, what do they call it, exponential it's not just multiplying by two. It's not, getting, it's not just getting twice as bad. It's like twice as bad, and then four times as bad, and then 16 times as bad. I mean, we've gotten to where, as a nation, what we were once founded upon, absolutely biblical principles. Then you read the Mayflower Compact, and what those people were dedicated to when they came to this land. And we are in the place now where we literally call bad good, and we call good bad. Now, that's where we live today. So I want to talk about the kingdoms of this world. Matter of fact, when I talk about the kingdoms of this world, I want to talk about 
the God of this world. Now, I said kingdoms of this world, that is plural. There are a whole lot of little fiefdoms in the world today. Now, let me pull back the curtain and take you beyond, uh, you know, Khomeini and, you know, Chairman whatever his name is from China and, you know, all these guys. They have their little fiefdoms. But I want you to know that behind the scenes, in the spiritual, remember, there's a duality of existence in this world. At one moment, at every moment in time, there is both physical reality and spiritual reality. Physical reality, you need to get the right data, you need to read into the right data, and you need to make the right conclusions based on the right data. Well, the same thing is true about the spiritual reality. Number one, you need to be careful what spirit you're listening to. In case you didn't know, the spirits are broadcasting on all frequencies. And the reason why we are tempted, the Bible says, the devil entices us. How does he do that? I know the little cartoon show, the little red guy in the red suit with pitchfork by this ear and the little angel over here on this ear. And I know that's kind of an uh, uh, artistic expression, but there is some truth to the fact that we as both physical and spiritual beings are able to receive both physical data and spiritual data. And in our mind, in our physical realm, uh, here, to touch, taste, see, smell, we pick up physical data. But in our spirit which was part of our nature when God created us, which enables us to have fellowship with God who is a spirit. By the way, God didn't have a body until Jesus was conceived in the womb of a virgin. Now he has a body and he took that body back to heaven. So we can say that God has both physical and spiritual existence, but before he was just a spirit. And we might say just a spirit. Well, the, the spiritual reality is the eternal one. The physical reality is what's temporary. And oh, we don't realize that. We think this is so permanent. What's the big lie that De Beers wants you to believe? Diamonds are forever. Take a little torch to them and it won't be forever. It'll, go, it'll burn up. It's carbon. This world's not forever. The Bible says one day the elements shall melt with a fervent heat. Your <laughs> Brother Billy, even the Fords are going to burn up one day. I'm telling you. They may be the last to burn, but you know. And Chevys, you know, well, you know. Depending on your personal data, you know, it's okay. By the way, let's get this out in the open. Yesterday was a great learning day in the SEC, and we'll just leave it at that and move on. Yeah, I know. Um, because we are spiritual beings, and our spirit is, is it's got an open receiver. You know, like a radio. A radio is a receiver. You got a radio transmitter, you got a radio receiver. We are radio receivers, in a sense. We pick up spiritual messages. And spirits can whisper in your ear. Did you know that God is speaking to you? Did you know that God is broadcasting on all channels? We just got to stand still and listen. Be still and know that He's God. Man, you, this is one more, one more reason why you need to take day off. And don't crowd that day off with stuff. Spend some time sitting down, doing. I like what the old fella said. Don't just do something. Stand there. Be still. Listen. But those other spirits are broadcasting on all frequencies too. Now, they can't tell you what to do. God won't tell you what to do. He'll tell you what you should do. But God, though He is Lord offers you a choice and you have to make the right choice. You have to choose to hear. You have to choose to respond in faith. You have to choose to obey. But these other spirits, there's a kingdom in this world because there are spirits that are enticing people. Let me use a phrase. Adolf Hitler, Mao Zedong, Joseph Stalin, Paul Pot were spirit led men. Problem is, they listen to the wrong spirits. And all of those spirits which were once holy angels, we touched on that last week, one third of the holy angels followed the devil in his rebellion. And they're what we call devils or demons. They are supernatural beings. They are, all of them are bigger than we are, but Jesus is bigger than all of them. 
they take hold of people. Not because they can force you to do anything, but they will entice you. And when you yield to them, you become their servant. You become, as the English would say, subjects to them. You become subjects of their kingdom. And the kingdoms, the multi-kingdoms of this world are all being, you know, we, how many of you have ever been a conspiracy theorist? I have. You know, the vast left-wing conspiracy. Let me tell you something. Don't invest so much respect into people who are in politics. You know, they, they're not running the show. It's those spirits behind the scenes that are pushing the buttons of the politics. The vast conspiracy is unseen. It's the spirit who's driving the people. Now, there are, uh, there are good spirit-led people in politics. There are people who are led by the Holy Spirit. And brother, are they swimming upstream in a downstream world? Don't tell it. No, you have to tell them. Tell them you understand. Tell them you're praying for them. They need that. But there's a lot of them out there. They like greed. They like pride. They like lust. And that little spirit comes along and says, Oh, you do what I say. You're going to have a lot of pleasure. You're going to have a lot of money. You're going to have a lot of power and pride. And they fall for it. And they're like little puppets on strings. They have choices at first. You know, at first you make choices, and pretty soon your choices make you. Habit starts out like a thread, ends up like a cable, enslaving you. And the kingdoms of this world... By the way, can I tell you this? How much is a... 1966 Ford Galaxy 500 worth. You know, and, 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 a, and a wise man would say, well, it depends on the condition of it. it. Depends on whether it's all original and all of that. Well, let me, let me take it into a different realm. You want to know what the value of something is? Here's how you answer whether it's valuable or not. Is it temporary or is it permanent? Now, by the way, Everything that you can see, hear, taste, touch, and smell is going to pass away. This is why Jesus said, don't lay up treasures on earth. Lay up treasures in heaven where it won't rot, where it won't rust, where the bugs won't eat it, and nobody can steal it. And Peter added one more to that list, where it won't burn up. Because he said, one day all the elements shall melt with a fervent heat. Thermonuclear fission. I get fusion and fission mixed up. You see, if it's temporary, why invest in it? A lot of times in National Forest, people will get a 99-year lease on a little piece of property because they say, you know, it's worth paying that lease for 99 years so that my family will get to hang out in those woods that we love so much. But they do it with the understanding that one day it's going to be gone. So they don't pay as much for the lease of that property as they would for a piece of property they could purchase and pass on to their family because when the, year's up, when the lease is up, that's it. It's temporary. It goes away. By the way, how many of y'all know that you personally, how many of you go to the grocery store and you check the expiration date? Do you check the expiration date? You better. You better. You get milk with the expiration date that was last week. You're going to open it in just a few days. It's going to be gone. <laughs> Unless you, like, clabber. You have an expiration date. And so everything you see here, taste, tell, and, uh, taste smell, and touch, whether it passes away or not, it will pass away to you. My point is this, and I better get to it. You get connected to the kingdoms of this world, and you set your affection on the things of the kingdoms of this world. You have made a bad investment because you have invested in the temporary. By the way, which kingdom is the greatest? The kingdom that's going to last what was the German said for the thousand year Reich? You see how long that lasted? Not very long. Thank God for them that stood up for him, stood up to him, put him down. Thank God for his grace to put him down. That's temporary. 
the greatest kingdom is the permanent kingdom. And the kingdoms of this world, every one of them are temporary. Listen to me. Let me be your investment counselor. Why invest your sweat, your emotions, your affections, your time in wood, hay, and stubble? I've been in, in uh, California. I've seen how dry it gets out there. I'm telling you, in the middle of summer, there ain't nothing but wood, hay, and stubble. And uh, brother, all it takes is one match. Whew! Away it goes. Why invest in that? when you could invest in something that's permanent. You see, the kingdoms of this world are temporary. Now the problem with the kingdoms of this world is they have a bad king. You know who he is? 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4 says, it talks about the God of this world. I'm going to fool you just a little bit unless you're sharp. Guess who the God of this world is? Notice, notice, it's got a little g. It's got a little g. That's not a title of respect. Who's the God of this world? Yeah. Lucifer, Satan, the devil. And he has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. You wonder why you try, you try to tell people about Jesus and they don't see what you see? Because they're blind. That's why you've got to pray for them. Don't just witness to somebody. Pray for them. Then witness to them. Matter of fact, pray for them while you're witnessing to them. I've read in the Bible, Nehemiah was standing before the king and the king asked him a question and from the time the king asked him the question and the time he answered, he had prayed to God. You read that in Nehemiah? He was praying to God. How am I going to answer this king? He was talking to the king and praying at the same time. That's another subject. The devil is the God of this world and he has blinded the minds of them that don't believe because he doesn't want them to see the gospel. He doesn't want them to be saved. Uh, in 1 John chapter 5, the apostle wrote these words by inspiration. He says, and we know that we believers are of God with a big G and the whole world. Let me ask you this question. What does whole mean? This is the whole handkerchief, front and back. Whole. That's every bit of it. Sides. That's all. It's the whole handkerchief. This is half the handkerchief. Actually, it's only a quarter because you're only seeing one side of well, the outside of it. There's an inside of it too, you see. When it says that the whole world lies in the evil one, the whole world, it says wickedness, and the word there really means, it's, 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 a, it's a personalized, it's, 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 it means the evil. And the evil is the evil one. The whole world is sitting on the lap like a lap dog of wickedness, of the wicked one. You see, the kingdoms of this world are being run by the God of this world. You say, how did that happen? We don't have time to go into a lot of details, but let me tell you in the beginning, uh, God gave the dominion over the earth to who? Adam and Eve. Have dominion over the earth. He said that. You can quote him. You can read it. And then the devil came in and he said, I can usurp that authority. If I get them to fall, I get to take it. It's kind of like king of the hill. You knock the guy off the hill. You king of the hill. And the devil took charge of this world. Now, it's only temporary. But the kingdoms of this world, plural, are all subject to the God of this world. And so you see, that's what's going on around us. And uh, temporary is not important. So, uh, Revelation eleven fifteen. 15, go ahead to that quickly. I'm, boy, I'm going to run out of time. This is the book of Revelation. That seventh angel sounds his trumpet. And there were great voices in heaven saying, notice this, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. And he shall reign forever and ever. So what you want, you want temporary 
or permanent. You see, the nature of the kingdoms of this world is temporary, and it was done by extortion. It was done by subversion. It was done by usurpation. And Jesus is going to come back and fix that. All of the kingdoms of this world are going to become the kingdom of our Christ. One more thing I want to throw in there. Remember, the nature of the kingdoms of this world. I can sum it up in the words that Jesus spoke in John chapter 10 and verse 10. Now Jesus called the devil the thief. That's the title he gave to him. Look at it. The thief only comes, he comes not but, to steal, to kill, and to destroy. O.R.G. Lee preached a, a sermon, great sermon. You ought to look it up on YouTube, listen to it. It's called Payday Someday. And I'm telling you one of the strongest lines of that is the devil pays in counterfeit bills. He's bogus. He comes to steal. He comes to kill. He comes to destroy. May I say in just simple terms, He ain't your friend. And He'll offer you everything. He'll not only give you nothing, but He'll only use it as bait to sink His flesh hooks in you and pull you down. The thief only comes but to steal and kill and destroy. But look at the nature of the other kingdom and the other king. But I've come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. If there was ever a contrast clearer than black and white, it's right there in that, in that verse, right there. That's clearer than black and white. You want to be stolen, killed, and destroyed, or do you want to have life and abundant life? You see, Jesus, these three things about His kingdom. Number one, His rule will never end. Verse 8, it says, Thy throne, O God, is forever and forever. Verse 10 and 12, You laid the foundation of the earth. They're the works of your hands. They'll perish, but you remain. They'll wax old, but you, your years shall not fail. As Jesus taught His disciples to pray in Matthew chapter 6, verse 13, For thine is the kingdom the power and the glory for when? And ever. And ever. And ever. And ad infinitum. Jesus said before Abraham was, I am. Jesus said, O Father, glorify me with the, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Jesus said in Revelation 1.8, I am the Alpha and Omega. That's first and the last letter of the Greek alphabet. I am the beginning and the end, saith the Lord, which is, which was, and which is to come. Amen. The first aspect of His kingdom is that it is forever. The second aspect of His kingdom is that it is a dominion of perfect righteousness. Oh, I need an hour just to speak on this subject. Let me say in a, three minutes. It says in verse 8 that His scepter is a scepter of righteousness. A scepter is like a, 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 a symbolic club. And it's usually customized to reflect on the person that's holding it. The one who's rightful king. And a scepter is the symbol of His authority. And His authority is an authority of righteousness. I can't begin to tell you in days what righteousness is, but I pray the Holy Spirit speaks to your heart and says, let me tell you what you think is righteousness and what Jesus thinks is righteousness. It ought to be the same thing, but it usually isn't. He loves righteousness. But notice, at the same time, He hates evil. You want to live right? You want to be free from the dominion of addictions and habits and compulsions? Then love righteousness. Set your... By the way, you have the power to, to love whatever you want to. I chose to marry this woman. I made a decision in 1973. It stuck for 46 years. And it's just getting better. But I made a choice. I set my... There's a lot of women in this world. Most of them wouldn't have me, but this one would. And I figured if she'll have me, I'll have her. And, you know, wonderful, wonderful woman. I set my affection upon her. You can set your affection upon righteousness. 
And at the same time, and by the way, listen to me carefully. I'm going to say it simple so I don't have to explain it. If you don't hate righteousness, you won't love. Excuse me, I got that backwards. If you don't hate iniquity, you can't love righteousness. It has to happen at the same time. And the last time you got in trouble, last time you told a lie, the last time you looked at something you shouldn't have looked at, the last time you got mixed up in the tar baby, it's because you didn't hate iniquity. Let me tell you something. I can tell you that in the book of Revelation when it talks about heaven, there ain't no liars there. There ain't no thieving there. There's no killing there. There's no darkness there. If you don't hate evil, there's going to be no place for you up there. We need to love righteousness and we need to hate evil. Why? Because that's the kind of king Jesus is. Now listen to me very quickly. He can take old, sorry, unrighteous people like me and like you. And He can clean us up. And He can change the wanter in our heart. You know how you quit loving sin? You don't just say, I'm going to hate sin. Now that needs to be the decision of your heart. But what you got to do is you got to reach out to the powerful God and Creator and say, oh God, create in me a clean heart, oh God. I'm telling you, God likes praying like that. And God, I can tell you on my own personal experience, God answers prayers like that. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God. And a clean heart is a heart that hates evil. And a heart that loves righteousness. This is who the king is. And this is what kind of a kingdom. May I just read you, uh, just in case you didn't know what evil was. Proverbs 6 says, These six things does the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination to Him. A proud look. God hates pride. A lying tongue. Hands that shed innocent blood. A heart that devises wicked imaginations. Feet that are swift in running to mischief. A false witness that speaks lies. And he that sows discord among brethren. You know, we heard Julie Andrews sing, these are a few of my favorite things. These are a few of God's least favorite things. We can learn to love righteousness. We can learn to hate evil. Last of all, and I'm done. His rule will not have an end. His rule is a dominion of perfect righteousness. And His rule is a dominion of joy. Joy is more than happiness. Happiness depends on happenings or haps. Joy transcends happiness. Old Paul and Silas got beat up and bloodied and shoved in the basement of a nasty, filthy jail, manacled, sitting up on a cold stone floor. What were they doing? They were singing, Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. They got to singing so much, God said, God reached out there and He just applauded. And as He applauded, the, the earthquake shook the prison and all the doors fell off the hinges and the manacles fell off their hands. Let me tell you, joy transcends circumstances. And the kingdom of our Lord is a kingdom of joy. He has been anointed with the oil of gladness above His fellows. It says in John 15, 11, These things, I, this is where Jesus is speaking. He said, These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. Let me tell you something. When I was 18 years old, I had an inheritance. I had money. I had a car. I was out of school. I had my freedom. I thought, man, I'm going to be happy now. Nobody tell me what to do. I can do as I please. I can hang out whoever I want to. I can travel and have adventure. 
And every day of my life's journey got worse and worse and worse. Because you mess with that tar, baby, you're going to get deeply stuck in that tar. Let me tell you what happened. As I gradually became less and less happy, I said, I need joy in my life. And finally, through a series of events that God had orchestrated, He brought me to the place that I fell on my knees and I said, Jesus, would you forgive my sin? Would you come into my life? I'm a miserable, unhappy, filthy sinner. And I deserve to die, but I believe you died for me and rose again. And I called upon the Lord Jesus. Two things entered my heart. First of all, my guilt and shame went flying like a flock of doves. In the second moment, the peace of God that passes understanding entered my body and hasn't left me yet. And at the same time, I experienced J-O-Y for the first time in my life. I didn't know what was going to happen. I thought, man, I'm going to have to become a missionary to some aboriginal place where I've never been. I'm going to go and die for the kingdom. And I'm going to have to give up everything that's any fun. I'll, I'll eat bread and water the rest. I was ready to do anything for Jesus. I was ready for change. Well, my life has been a different story. But in that story, I've had the joy of the Lord to be my strength every day. And this is a characteristic of His kingdom. And the believer, no matter what they go through in this world, can have joy. All-encompassing joy. Full joy, as Jesus declared it. The J-O-I is only found in J-E-S-U-S. -S. If you don't have Jesus as your Savior, you need to come down to this altar. You need to come quick.